Hosanna in the highest to our Lord. Go ahead and just take a posture of worship this morning that's comfortable for you, whether that's standing or sitting. Um, we're gonna do the same up here. And just what I want to communicate to you this morning is the Lord is worthy of our worship. He is good, he is kind, and we celebrate today on Palm Sunday that approximately 2,000 years ago, Jesus entered into the city. He entered into Jerusalem in preparation for his crucifixion. He was preparing to die the most brutal death, but we know that the story didn't end there, and he actually victoriously rose to save us from our sins. And so he is worthy this morning, amen? Amen. Our God is alive and we celebrate him. So let's just worship together and we're going to sing Hosanna um, just like they did, just as they proclaimed as Jesus was entering the city. So just worship with us this morning. Hosanna, Hosanna.
You can give him praise this morning. That's okay. <laughs> we do that here. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, we're, we're going to do a new song this morning, and I'm, I'm really excited about it. This song has meant a lot to me. Um, just in the past season, I've been looking back at what God has done. And there's so many things. There's so many stories that I could tell you of God's faithfulness in my life. And I'm sure that many of us could say the same. And amen, amen. And I was just brought to um, Psalm 34, verse four says, I sought the Lord and he answered and he delivered me from all my fears. And verse five says, those who look to him are radiant and their faces will never be darkened with shame. And I just know that we serve a good God. And even if you're walking through something this morning that looks dark, that looks like God's not gonna come through, let me tell you with full authority of what God has done in my life, he will come through. He will come through. He loves you. And his answer to you might not be a yes to what you're asking for, but his no is good and he loves you and he's for you and you can trust him. And I just, I get emotional because he's been so kind. He's been so good. There's been so many things. I just look back and I say, God, I wanted something different, but your way was better. His way is better. And I don't wanna um, neglect the fact that some of you are walking through really hard things. You might be walking through loss or something really difficult, but God is for you and he's with you. And if you don't walk away with anything else this morning, just know that, know that he loves you. Amen? Amen. Oh, I'm not even gonna be able to sing this song. <laughs> You've probably heard it. It's on the radio. It's called Trusting God by Elevation Worship. So let's just sing it if you know it and let's praise the Lord. <laughs>
last chorus with me? I As I was listening to that song earlier this week, I realized that I never sat and thought about what that phrase means, I exalt thee. And what the Lord revealed to me in my heart was that it's not just words that we sing because it's a nice melody and it sounds poetic, but there's actually something that God does in our hearts when we sing that. He brings to mind the things that we oftentimes place before him place before our relationship with, with him, whether it's how we spend our time, whether it's our families or our careers. And the invitation that he gave me was to simply hold it out in my hands, those things that I often put as a priority over him, to lay it at his feet and then to surrender and truly mean, I exalt you over the things that I just laid at your feet. And so we're gonna sing that chorus again. And I imagine that the Lord is gonna bring up some things in your mind of opportunities to surrender to him, things in your life that you prioritize, that God is saying, just bring it to me because he will not fail us in those areas. And he is trustworthy enough for us to surrender it to him and say, I exalt you, I place you higher than the thing that I laid at your feet. So would you, along with me, would you raise out your hands like this? It might feel a little bit weird for some of you. And as we start singing this, start to imagine laying those things that are in your life at his feet. And then when you're ready to lift up your hands as we sing, I exalt thee. So let's do that together.
Amen, amen. I imagine that as God looks down in this room, he is so filled of joy seeing all of us, his sons and his daughters, submitting and surrendering to him because we know that he is worthy and he is trustworthy to be exalted. So I'd love to pray for us to close out this moment of worshiping in full surrender to our Lord and Savior Jesus. So let's pray. God, we surrender these things to you because you have not failed us and you will not fail us. You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy to be exalted over everything in our lives, not just for this moment, but even Monday through Saturday, inviting you into our lives. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, everyone says, Amen. You can go ahead and take a seat. And as you take a seat, I'm going to invite some of our students up as well as Pastor David onto the stage. Uh, this group of students has an opportunity to invite God into something that they're doing this week. And they're being sent out on a mission trip to Memphis. And so we're going to take some time to encourage them, pray over them, and send them out for all that God wants to do in their hearts and in the hearts of people that they're serving. So I'll toss it off to David. Yeah, so this is a fun part that we get to be uh, a part of here just as a church as we commission them and send them out. So the reason we wanted them up on stage first is a bunch of you probably know them, you're related to them, maybe you birthed them, uh, whatever it is. I wanna invite you right now uh, to go ahead and come forward. And we're actually gonna ask the students, go ahead right now, if you guys wanna come down right here on this part, if you if you have a relationship with any of these students, I just wanna invite you to come forward right now uh, and, and put a hand on their shoulder. And I, I wanna invite all of us to be a part of just this special moment. The Bible uh, actually talks about it in multiple multiple different parts, how significant it is, the laying on of hands to commission people. And so that's what we wanna do. That's what we wanna invite you into. And then also, if you're not up front right now, I wanna invite you to stand uh, because you're just as uh, important as a part of this uh, as anybody. So what I wanna invite all of you to do as people are still coming forward is just to extend a hand like this, uh, just that you would be a part of this special moment where we get to commission this group of students as they go out to Memphis uh, this next week here. So. Let me pray for us and go ahead and keep walking down too if you didn't make it up yet. So, Father, we just come before you right now just in this special moment uh, where we get to commission a bunch of men and women who love you, who are pursuing you with their lives, who are taking the step of sacrificing uh, a spring break where they could do anything else, uh, but they decided to jump on this trip, Lord. And I know your hand is on each and every one of their lives. I know your hand uh, has, has led them to this point. And so what we pray for right now, just through the power of the Holy Spirit, is that you, that you would bless them in this week of uh, the trip that they're leaving for in a week from now that you would be with them, that you would go with them, that you would provide for them. I pray, Lord, as I think about all these experiences that I've had in my own life uh, of leaving the comfort and the safety of home and of mom and dad and going on a trip and just sensing, okay, God, what are you doing, not just through me, but what are you doing in me? What we just pray for right now, Holy Spirit, is that you would just make a deposit in them and in their lives, that they would look back on this trip, that they would look back on this experience right now forever, and they would remember, man, I, I remember that when God spoke to me. I remember when God called me into that. I remember when God revealed something. I remember when God brought healing. I just pray through your Holy Spirit that you would just bring about something significant, that you would plant seeds right now deep into their hearts that would yield fruit for the rest of their lives. And I pray also, Lord, that our church would rally around them, not just today, not just right now, not just in this moment, but from this point forward that we would pray for them every day, that we'd set an alarm on our phones or that as we spend our own time with you in prayer or studying your word, I pray that we would think of them and we'd think of these students and we would pray that you would work in them and through them in a mighty and powerful way. God, we know you're real. You're worthy of all of our worship. And so we, just as a posture right now, we surrender our lives. We lay down uh, what it is that you've entrusted us. We lay it back down at the foot of the cross and we ask you to do something eternal through it. So Jesus, thank you for these students. Thank you for these families. I pray that you would provide for this team, provide for this trip, use them in a powerful way and make a deposit in them that yields fruit for eternity. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said together. Amen. 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 Can we celebrate with them this morning?
We would love it if you could continue praying for them this week as they are sent out, as they uh, continue to allow God to do works in their hearts, as well as are just open to inviting God to do whatever he wants to do as they serve. So we're excited to hear stories when they return. Um, this morning, there is so much to celebrate. There's so much that God is inviting us into. And as we look ahead to Easter Sunday next week, there's going to be a ton of people here at the church who get to hear the salvation message and respond to it. And so there's an opportunity for us as a church to come alongside new believers and encourage them. So if you're someone in this room who has been investing in your relationship with Jesus, who's been digging deep, and you're wondering, how can I keep growing? What's my next step in growing in faith? then we want to invite you into something called Grow Together. And it's an invitation for those of you who are disciples. We're going to encourage each other to continue growing, but then to go out and make more disciples. Matthew 28, 19 says, go and make disciples. And so that's exactly what we are called to do. And that's what that environment is for. So I encourage you in all these different areas to lean in, whether you're being sent out on a missions trip or whether you're investing in your family and your relationship, surrendering things to God, or something like grow together, uh, the invitation from God is just to say, God, what, how do you want me to engage in this? And maybe for you, it's through giving financially to allow other people to do that. And so at Frontline, we have a missions fund that's separate from our general budget. And so if you feel like the Lord's inviting you to give financially, to allow other people to be sent out to make disciples, I'd love for you to prayerfully consider that. And when you go online to give to the missions fund, it is a separate drop down. So make sure you choose the one that says missions fund. And God's going to honor, the, honor that. He's going to do amazing, incredible things as we as a church send people out into Memphis and globally into our community as well as alongside other people. So I invite you and challenge you to keep leaning into what God has for you, especially as we lean into this message about legacy this morning. Well, hey, good morning, everybody. Wasn't that special just to be a part of? Uh, that was my favorite part. I'm just going to tell you, it's going to be uh, downhill from here. It's not going to be as good as what that just was. So uh, I have a confession for you. I hated school. Uh, I don't know if there's anybody else in the room that hated school. Uh, I hated it. My, my issue was I got bored. And uh, the, the worst it got, I think, was in seminary. Uh, so seminary is basically graduate school for pastors. So yeah, you're like, what? You ended up here and you hated that? I did. I wish I didn't, uh, but I did. I found out I had this opportunity to switch from in-person school to online school. That was my jam. Uh, I could do it when I was in the mode to do it, and I could plow as hard as I could and get as far as I could. But there was one caveat to doing online school, online graduate school, that I just absolutely detested, and that was they made us come in person for 40 hours in one week. So if you don't like the classroom, I mean, it's just a death week. It's just awful. So I had to drive down. I went to a seminary called Western Theological Seminary. It's affiliated with Hope down in Holland. So I drove down once a semester for the entire week, I'd spent 40 hours in the classroom, and I dreaded it. I absolutely dreaded it. And so, true story, I'm not even kidding, they would give us breaks throughout the day, uh, probably for people like me, it's like, I can't do this anymore, my brain hurts, I don't function like everybody else. So what I would do is, on the breaks, instead of kind of lingering and talking to everybody else, I would walk, and I would walk a mile away, and this would be my preferred destination. I'd walk to the local cemetery, because my preference was I'd rather walk among the dead than a whole bunch of future pastors. 
I'm like, I just need to get out of here. I don't think like this. I don't whatever. So I'm not even kidding with you. I, I would walk the cemetery and, and no joke, it became my favorite part of seminary is going to the cemetery. And so often, sometimes I mix them up. I'm like back in cemetery, I mean seminary, whatever it was, this is what I learned, etc. God did a real work in my own life and in my own heart. And, and honestly, if I look at that last photo of the cemetery, I, there's actually fond memories that I have with God in that place. I don't know if you like going to cemeteries, if you don't like going to cemeteries. Most of us have awful memories uh, that are associated with cemeteries, losing somebody that we love. When I would walk the streets of the cemetery, I would read like the different gravestones. I just read them and it's pretty amazing that you can boil an entire human life down to just a stone, isn't it? You know, the average gravestone size is 12 by 24 inches. So your whole life can be boiled down into this very small surface. And the reason why I loved it so much and being there and walking is it reminded me that I have an appointment with death just like all of us. And in fact, it was the why. It was, this is why I'm in seminary. This is why I decided to go into ministry. This is also why I'm a follower of Jesus. It, the life that I've been given, just like the life that you've been given, is, is entrusted to you. It's a gift to you and God can use that life and he could use the time that you have to, to make an exponential and, and incredible impact in the lives of others, not just for this life, but also for eternity. It gets at the, what, what are you doing with the very precious and very limited time that you have here on this earth? So if I asked you a different question, I would ask you this. I'd say, what's the legacy that you want to leave behind? What's the thing that you wanna be remembered for? What's the investment in this world that you want your name attached to? If you think about your kids or your grandkids, what do you want them to say about you? If you think about maybe your employees or your employer, if you think about your neighbors or your friends, your family members that survive you, what do you want them to say about you, what I would say is it's funny how different we will all naturally live if we simply focus on the end of our lives rather than the present. So if I say the word legacy, what do you think of? What is it you, de you desire? Is it memories and special moments with your kids? Is it relationships that you have? Is it your name on a building or is it a business that you started? Is it good that you were able to accomplish in the world or in other parts of the world that lack? What, what is the thing that drives you and motivates you and moves you? Because here's the thing, and this is why we're closing out our series uh, of a healthy home on legacy is how the world would define legacy is quite different than how God would define legacy and particularly a successful legacy. So the guy that we're talking about today that I'm really excited about is, is a guy named Paul. Paul wrote uh, a lot of the New Testament of the Bible and, and a lot of his writings were letters that he was writing to other people or to other churches. And so what I love about the, the passage that we're gonna focus on today is not just the words that are written because the words are phenomenal. They're life changers. They can reorient your entire life. If you read them and you say, I want these to be my words. I wanna live this. I wanna act as if Paul's writing these words to me. It'll change everything. But it's not just the words he uses, it's actually where he writes these words. So Paul, the apostle Paul, finds himself in a Roman dungeon. Paul had been arrested multiple times. Uh, he had traveled, especially in Rome, and he would preach the gospel and he would teach people about Jesus. Well, the problem with the time that Paul was in Rome is there was a new emperor named Nero. You've probably heard of Nero before. Nero is known for being brutal towards Christians. He's the first one that actually targeted Christians, the first Roman emperor that targeted them. He would crucify Christians, he would burn them alive, he would imprison them. If you've heard of like the Roman games where they would throw people out and let wild beasts tear them apart, that was Nero that came up with that and he used Christians to do that. So Paul finds himself arrested. He finds himself in chains here in the dungeon with this tiny little hole at the top. This is where they would drop food in. Paul is in here and he's thinking this is probably the end. It's probably the end of the road for me. And if Paul was thinking that, he would have been correct because it's shortly after Paul pens these words that Paul is executed by Nero. It changes 
what he's about to write, doesn't it? Let's, let's read what Paul wrote. He's writing this to his, his young pastor friend named Timothy. He says, I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience. As night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Notice at this point of his life and as he's looking at the end of his life, what is Paul most concerned with? It's not his money, it's not his house, it's not his retirement, it's not some cottage, it's not his dog, it's not anything like that. What he's most concerned with is the spiritual legacy that will be left in his wake. What he's most concerned with is his friend Timothy, this young pastor who, who's about to lose this mentor and friend in Paul. What he's concerned with is what has been imparted to Timothy that actually takes root and translates to a significant impact for the kingdom of God after Paul is no longer here. That's what's moving him. That's what's driving him. That's what's motivating him. He's mentioning his grandmother, Lois, his mother, Eunice. It's so interesting. Even he says at the beginning, as my ancestors did with a clear conscience. What Paul is doing is he's looking at the lineage and the legacy of faith that both Paul and Timothy have been a part of. And he, he says, Timothy, I look at your mom and I look at your grandma and I look at the faith that they have and the faith I'm convinced as they led you to the Lord, as they introduced you to Jesus, as they deposited something inside of you in your soul, I'm convinced it's alive in you. I see it. He's calling this out, this legacy that you are now a part of, Timothy. And what Paul says is, and I'm, I'm there with you. Both of us are a part of this legacy. We're a part of something bigger that's going to last long after you and I are both here. And he's bringing his attention to it. So before I just move on, do you notice whose name isn't mentioned as Paul mentions Timothy's ancestors? His dad. If you look at different parts of the Bible, Acts 16 is one of the references. It actually talks about Timothy's dad and he's referred to as a Greek. Now, to you, that might not mean anything, but Greek or Gentile, sometimes those words were interchangeable. What most scholars believe is that Timothy's dad did not have a relationship with Jesus and had no belief in him whatsoever. So think about, think about this complexity here that Timothy has is he's looking at his mom and he's looking at his dad and one of them has faith and one of them doesn't. One of them is a part of the spiritual legacy that has preceded him and one of them does not. And you see this even throughout Timothy's life. He was conflicted with that, that. He struggled with that. There was a timidity that he had because he's looking at the history and the people that went before him and, and his ancestors. And, and he's saying some of this like is mine, but then some of this I don't align with or I don't agree with or, or I'm different. Maybe he's the first version of it. The reason I wanted to bring attention to that is to say this to you. Maybe you're the first one in your family. Maybe you're the first one to have a relationship with God. If you look at your parents and you long to see them have a relationship with God, you're in good company with other characters in the Bible. Maybe you grew up in a home where two parents had different faith backgrounds, or maybe you only grew up with one parent growing up in the home. Maybe, maybe you were in foster care, you were adopted, and you say, I don't really know who my parents were, or I do know who my parents were, and they both definitely didn't have a relationship with God. Whatever it is that your situation was or your family, there's, there's this incredible thing that happens in the kingdom of God that you can be grafted into a spiritual legacy of those that go before you, and it's not just related to your bloodline. It's related to a totally different bloodline, which is Jesus. Paul, as he's writing to Timothy, he's saying, I, I want to show you the thread, Timothy, that you're a part of. And for you, what I'd ask you is, who's the thread of faith that has led you to this point? Who before you has deposited something into you or invested into you? Who, who had a relationship with Jesus that led to questions for you or you fell back on in a later season of life or maybe they invited you here today? Who is it that is a part of this legacy that you find yourself in? Because Paul is bringing Timothy's attention to that. He's saying, look at, look at what you get to be a part of. And then here's what he says, 2 Timothy 1, verse 6. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. See why we laid hands this morning on the students going out? 
There's something powerful that happens. There's a legacy that's a part of that we get invited into through faith and through the laying on of hands. And he says this, verse 7, For the Spirit of God, or the Spirit God gave us, does not make us timid, but gives us power and love and self-discipline. My favorite set of words in this passage is fan into flame. Any of you built a campfire before? Anybody in this room? Anybody? Okay, you're waking up. We'll get there. Campfires. My favorite part, this, this is the best part of camping for me, is setting stuff on fire. That's what I loved all growing up. And so I, I would find this. doesn't matter where it was. We had a little pop-up camper growing up. I would find the matches. I'd light them on fire just because. Just because that's fun, because I was a young kid. So when Paul says fan into flame, I want to paint a picture for you. You know the part of the fire when you're building a campfire and you got to get a bunch of really dried leaves and really tiny twigs? You know when that flame first catches right at the beginning where it's no longer on the easy stuff like the leaves or the newspaper? And it, you know when it first catches that small twig? Let me show you. That's a bad example. <laughs> I knew this was going to happen. So you know what I'm talking about. When the smallest flame and it exists right there at the bottom. And you're looking at it, and, and you finally got it to catch, and everything in your mind says, don't let it die. You know what I'm talking about? What's so funny about fires that I think we, we often forget, especially if you don't do it often, is a fire needs oxygen. So right, right when it's kindled, right at the bottom, right when that flame is starting, and it's starting to catch, we, we know the flame can do two things at this point. It can continue to grow, and it can consume everything in its path, and it will grow to the extent that it is fed, or it'll extinguish, and it'll go out, a little smoky. What Paul is saying to Timothy is he's saying, I see the flame. I see it inside of you. It started with your grandmother, Lois, and your mom, Eunice, and I see it, it's starting to catch. It's starting to grow. Timothy, what I'm encouraging you to do is to fan that flame, to give it oxygen, to feed it, to allow it to grow, to breathe on it, to invest in it, to, to encourage Timothy, that faith piece, the piece that's small right now. I know it's small and I know it's fragile and I know you say, I don't know if this is real or if it's not real or I still have questions or everything's not answered yet. Paul is saying, Timothy, I want you to fan that flame. I want you to invest in it. I want you to have other people around you that start praying over you, that start investing in you, that start depositing things inside of you for the purposes of the kingdom of God because I see the flame and the flame is there and if you continue to invest, and if you continue to fan, and if you continue to give that thing oxygen, it will grow so far beyond what you could have ever imagined because you're part of something that is bigger than you. That's a dying man's plea with his young protege. So you have it. Friends, what I would tell you is you have that. The relationship with Jesus that you have, albeit it might be big or small, but there's something inside of you, a deposit that is made inside of you. And some of you have fed it for a lifetime and you see and you know that when this thing grows, it will consume everything in its path. But some of you have a very small faith right now and I don't want you to be discouraged by it. I don't want you to be discouraged by your questions. I don't want you to be discouraged by the fact that you don't see it playing out in your life. I don't want you to be discouraged when you look at your family or you look at your context or you look at your workplace or you look at the legacy that if you died right now, the legacy that would be left, I don't want you to be discouraged. Just like Paul is encouraging Timothy, let me encourage you, fan the flame. Just fan the flame, give it oxygen, spend time in the word of God. Allow other people in your life to walk with you and to pray over you and to lay hands on you, to fan that flame because as it grows, it will change everything and your legacy that will be left will be unbelievable. Paul continues, he says this, so do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or me, his prisoner. Rather, join me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy, say this word with me, life. Okay, say it like you're alive, though. Life. life. Come on. He's saying, Timothy, you have a life. 
Paul's about to lose his. He's looking at Timothy and he says this, God has not just called us to a holy legacy. The legacy part doesn't happen once we die. The legacy part is written while we are still alive. He's saying to Timothy how you use your life, what you invest in in your life, what you fuel in your life, the flame that you give attention to in your life. That's what God has called us to, not because of anything we've done, but because of his own purpose and grace. If I could boil it down and say it in a really easy, simple way, I would say it just like this. Legacy is not just something you leave, it's something you live. Every single person can walk out with that today. It doesn't matter if you're 8, 18, 38, 58, 88, 108. This applies to you. Your legacy that you will leave behind and the spiritual impact that you can impart to other people, the deposit that you can make for the kingdom of God does not start after you die. The world would define legacy as whatever is remembered about you when you're gone. God's got a different plan. It's how you live your life. Well, that starts to encompass every single facet of your life. This is how you relate to your spouse or your significant other. This is for your kids. This is your job. This is who you live next to. This is your stuff and how you manage money. What Paul is encouraging Timothy, just like God is encouraging all of us, is to live our lives in a way that is worthy of the calling that God has placed on them. That's what he's begging us to do. And then he closes with this here, 2 Timothy 1.14. He says, guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. I love that terminology. Guard the deposit. Guard the deposit. Protect the deposit. Fan the flame of what is inside of you. I wrote this funny line. I don't know if you'll relate to it or not. I will not be written into the wills of some of the most impactful people of my life. If I look at the legacy of faith that I'm a part of, that have helped lead to the place that I'm in today, so many of those people were not a part of my blood family. I wrote the people that changed my life deposited something in me spiritually. They invested in my heart and in my health, in my faith. They invested in my marriage and my parenting in, in ministry. I mean, this, this is such an easy message. Many of you know Brian. Brian's our senior pastor of the Zero Collective. He's one of the people on my list. Somebody, somebody that invested in me and imparted something to me and deposited something in me that has changed the course of the trajectory of my life. Another one's Blake, Blake Hicks. He's our executive pastor. He's another one that has invested and poured into and deposited something in my life. I've got former counselors on here. I've got friends on here. I've got an old youth pastor on here. I, I have in-laws in here. I have former pastors in here. Th- this long list is, is people. That's what connects all of them together. Otherwise, they're in all sorts of different facets and jobs, careers. They're in different age groups and demographics. Some of them grew up in a home that that faith was foundational and others grew up that faith had nothing to do with their upbringing. All of these people have seen their lives as living into a legacy that is not about them, but it's actually about the person of Jesus. And I get to stand on this stage and say, there's no way I would have gotten here by myself. In life, in job, in career, in marriage, in parenting, as if I look behind me, there is a wake of people. Many of them are you sitting here in this room who prayed for me, who encouraged me, who supported me, who walked alongside me. I'm, I'm indebted to those that are in my wake. Paul is bringing Timothy's attention and he's not just saying, look backwards and look at, look at all of those that have invested in you and deposited something inside of you. Acknowledge that, but then he does this, but now look forward. Who is it that you're doing that for? Who who is it that you can deposit something into for their faith, for their walk with Jesus, their marriage, their relationship, a place where they need healing? Every single one of us has this flame that lives inside of us. This is why this is such a good metaphor. I can set a lot of stuff on fire in this room, can't I? (laughs) That's the metaphor. Isn't it funny when this fan, when, when the flame is fanned, when it begins to grow, you can transfer it. You can go person to person to person to person to person. 
Paul's imagery is perfect. The question I would ask all of you is if you look in your context, if you look around, if you look at the people you work next to, if you look at your family, if you look at your kids, if you look at those that you're in a small group with, if you look at this church, those that you live next to in your neighborhood, those that you work for or those that work for you, if you look at the context around you, where can you fan the flame in their life? Where can you be an encouragement? Where can you be a support? Where can you be an intercessor and pray for them? You know, there are so many opportunities for you. If you're saying, I don't know, I don't really have a lot of opportunities outside of this place. Do you know how many opportunities exist here at our church right now? It is endless. We keep talking to you about them. We talked to you about them last week. Here's some of them. One is our prayer team. I looked this up yesterday, how many prayer requests have actually come in. Uh, anytime you submit a prayer request, it's frontlinejr.com slash prayer. You fill out a request that goes to a spreadsheet that gets emailed out to our team once a week. And so our prayer team, who is from afar, reads through those requests and they pray for you. You're being prayed for every single day if you fill out a prayer request. What an invitation for all of us if you say, I, I can pray from home. I can pray in my, my Devo time. We're, we're taking in uh, just under an average of four prayer requests a day. We've taken in 282 prayer requests since January 1st. We're praying for you. I, I wanna invite you, would you also be one that fans the flame in other people's lives? Would you pray over them? We also have an intercessory team that's here on Sundays. They're praying right now. If you're saying, man, I, I just feel like God's given me something, like this heart and this desire that I wanna pray over people, I wanna make a deposit in people, I can pray. It's not gonna be pretty, it's not gonna be great, but I, I can pray, I can, I can put my hand on somebody's shoulder and I can just say, I, God, I just pray that you would work in this person's life for what they're asking you to do right now. If you can do that, we need you on the team. I'll go to the next one, missions. If we talk about missions, uh, there are so many opportunities here to serve, whether it's an essential store, if it's hand-to-hand, -hand, if it's going on a mission trip, like the students one going to Memphis, if it's Guatemala, we have trips coming up going to Guatemala or Ethiopia. You can sponsor a child in Ethiopia right now through our UCRO partnership. You can invest in people. You can fan the flame. You can pour gasoline on this fire that is kindled in the lives of so many other people and students and, and those that we get to serve in our community. This is what God God's actually inviting us to do is to fan the flame, not to consume the flame, to fan the flame, to invest the flame, to share the flame, to deposit something inside of the people around us. And the last one here is just our next gen ministries. Uh, there is an incredible opportunity for all of you to invest in the lives of, of children and students here at our church right now. One of the biggest needs we have in our entire church is with our children's ministry. We just need people. We need people who are willing to invest in the kingdom of God through very, very little, formidable, moldable hearts. Some of them are my own kids. If I look at middle school or high school, kids that are getting stuff thrown at them from all angles of life, and they're wondering, do people care? Do people see me? Do I matter? Do I have a role? Do I have a part? not just in the kingdom of God, but just in this world, you know what a difference you could make with a, such a small investment into their lives, serving with them, serving in one of those ministries, volunteering once a month, whatever it is, it would be an investment into the kingdom of God that would translate to a legacy that will span generations. We need people to do this well in these key areas of our church right now. And I wrote this, hope this doesn't offend you, but if it does, sorry. I don't wanna be a part of a church full of busy people. I wanna be a part of a church that invests in people. That says, I, I am gonna sacrifice for this. I'm gonna carve out time out of my week for this. I mean, we have an example of all of these students that just said, I'm willing to give up my spring break because I, I wanna go serve. I wanna go meet people that, that I may never meet again but maybe God can use me in their lives for a season and then maybe God can use them in my life for a season. Maybe God's cultivating something that he's inviting me to be a part of. What, what is it for you? What is God stirring in your heart? I had a conversation with a guy, it was such a fun convo. Uh, he's 60 years old, I wanna read my, my three bullet points that he shared with me that I wanted to share with you. Here's what he says at age 60. He says, way too many people my age are coasting. I don't want to die rusty. 
I want to die broken, using all that I have for the kingdom of God to the very end. I want to have to fit into the grave sideways. I don't even know what that means. If I thought that was so funny, I was like, sideways, what do you mean? And his whole point was, I, I will not leave this earth coasting. I will not leave this earth in neutral. I saw this post on social media. If I can share this with all of you, social media post says this, the most productive age in a human life is 60 years old and it continues into your 80s. If they look at the most productive season, 60 to mid 80s, right there. The biggest impact opportunity exists. If you're, if you're like, I'm in that range, I don't have the energy anymore to do the students thing or to do the kids thing, what I would tell you is your most productive years are right now. And not just our church, but the kingdom of God needs people that are willing to step in and say, I want to invest. I want to leave a legacy that doesn't just start after I die. It starts right now in my investment and my intentionality and the deposit spiritually that I can make in the lives of the people around me. I just want to invite you to be a part of that here at our church. If I think about Jesus' legacy, today's Palm Sunday. What an incredible moment that must have been. You know, you watch the video at the beginning where they, they drape their cloaks over the donkey and Jesus sits on the donkey and he rides down and people are shouting Hosanna and they're laying down the palm branches and it's emblematic of this is the king. This is the guy. This is, this is the leader. This is who we worship. And I just, I can only imagine the smile on Jesus' face, knowing what he was about to do, knowing he was going to go to the cross, that, that he'd be convicted not for anything that he had done. He was totally innocent, totally pure, the first human being on the planet to have ever accomplished the feat of living a perfect and holy life. And he traded that perfect and holy life for us. And as he sat on the donkey and as he went through the city, he knew that this was a, a procession for a king who was about to be buried. And he willingly sacrificed his life. Can you think about the legacy that he started that now we get to be a part of? If we think about the most impactful legacy that you could ever leave, the most important deposit that you could ever make into the lives of people, it is when your life is 100% aligned with Jesus. That's it. There's no amount of money you can leave behind. There's no amount of memories. There's no, no, nothing you leave will last the test of time other than Jesus. So if I can just bring us back to this. Are you fanning the flame in your own life, in the lives of your kids, of your grandkids, your neighbors, coworkers, friends? Are you fanning the flame of the thing that will outlast you? and generations, the, the thing that will make an impact on generations forever. Jesus' invitation to all of us is to align ourselves, align our hearts, align our lives, align our resources, align everything he has entrusted us with to him. Here's the last verse I want to read, 2 Timothy 1, verse 9. It says this, he has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Paul is writing to Timothy and he's saying, death doesn't get the final word. And it's all because of Jesus that when our lives are aligned with him, when our ministries are aligned with him, when our homes are aligned with him, and our marriages and our parenting, when things, everything that we've been entrusted to are aligned with him, the legacy that we leave behind us is Jesus. And he's the only thing that spans all generations. So just as we close, uh, the reason why this one hits deeply for me here is over the last three weeks, we've had two funerals here. Uh, for two women, ages 40 and 48. And it was awful. It died way too early, way too young. But I'll tell you, I was here for both of them and what was shared and the legacy that was left behind in both of their lives as both of them leave children behind them. The impact that they made on the kingdom of God was palpable. 
both of them leveraged their lives, they leveraged their time, they leveraged their resources, they poured out their lives for the kingdom of God. And it was story after story after story after person after person after person that kept talking, whether it was at the funeral or outside of the funeral or since. And, and it was, they'll, they'll have no idea what they did in me. They'll have no idea what sort of deposit they made in my life. They have no idea what the impact that they made on me. That's the type of legacy that we should all strive for. It's not one that starts when we die, it's, it starts right now. Aligning our lives, aligning our hearts, aligning our wallets, aligning our careers, aligning our families and our marriages and our time with Jesus. And what I will promise you is the impact that is left as a result will blow your mind because that flame will consume everything. It can't be extinguished. So I just want to invite you. There's a card on your seat as you came in. This is for you to take home. Read through it. Just talk about the legacy. What's, what's your story? What's the legacy of faith that maybe you stepped into, but also that you get to write for future generations? What do you want them to say about your relationship with Jesus? And allow that to steer you towards how to steward this precious life that we all have. Let's pray. God, we just come before you right now. And I just thank you for the legacy of Jesus, for Palm Sunday that we get to celebrate the king who didn't need to die, who didn't deserve to die, but who willingly died because we deserved it. The king that laid down his life and everything he was entitled to for us, who was entitled to hell and to separation from you for eternity. Jesus, we just wanna say thank you Thank you for grafting us into your kingdom and into your legacy. And what we pray right now, Jesus, is that we would be a church that looks like you, that we would be people that look like you, that we'd be parents, fathers, and mothers that look like you, and husbands and wives that look like you, and volunteers and small group leaders and student ministry volunteers that look like you, that we would serve our communities and our neighborhoods and our workplaces like people that look like you. I just pray right now, Jesus, that you that we would hand you back the pen of the story of our lives and we'd say, Jesus, what is it that you're inviting me into? What is it that you've deposited inside of me that needs to be fanned, that flame needs to grow so that I can also deposit that into the lives of other people around me? Not for my own purposes or my own legacy, but for the purposes of the kingdom of God. We make ourselves available to you and we love you. And we thank you for godly examples in scripture and even in our church, like the last three weeks that we can look to and model our lives after. We love you. We thank you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said together.
Shout Jesus from the mountain, Jesus in the street, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. That's how we want to leave here today is just proclaiming Jesus over everything. So I just want to invite you, if you want to extend your hands like this, it's just a posture of reception, uh, just to leave with a blessing that God has for you today. So brothers and sisters of Frontline Church, live a life that's worthy of the calling that you have received. As you leave here today, fan the flame of faith in your own heart, invite the Holy Spirit into that, and then allow him to work in every environment, every context, every relationship to bring about the kingdom of God, not just in you, but also through you. To go in his peace and in his strength and in his power. And all God's people said together, amen. amen. We love you. We'll see you next week for Easter.